The following content is provided by MIT OpenCourseWare under a Creative Commons license. Additional information about our license and MIT OpenCourseWare in general is available at ocw.mit.edu. When last we met, um, I think, so you have to remind me of this, I, I, I put the, uh, the bits on the handout that I didn't have from last time, but we talked about, if you look at the handout, we talked about what I'm calling the psychopathological theory of love and the chemical theory of attraction, right? I seem to recall that we finished up last time talking about the shaky bridge. So that allows me to start today talking about social exchange theory. Um, and uh, so we're actually sort of, I, I put the other stuff on there because I felt bad about not having it on there last time. Um, but so we, we, we'll, we'll start sort of in the top middle of page two. Um, and the, the question here continues to be, how do we explain why a particular relationship Happens. The evolutionary theory is good for saying something about broad forces, but now we want to know something about um, why specific relationships happen and do not happen. Um, and I can think of no better place to begin than with me as a high school freshman. Um, now, the reason that I'm explaining this as me as a high school freshman is I made, the, I made up this example a few years ago to illustrate the point that I wanted to make. And I, I, I ran through this elaborate scenario about uh, a high school freshman and stuff like that, and, and, and then I gave the, 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 your predecessors a choice. Did he do A or did he do B? Somebody raised their hand. He said B. I said, no, that's the wrong answer. And at that point, I realized I'd been giving autobiography. So I thought I might as well just go with the straight autobiography, um, which is, all right, you've got to imagine this high school freshman who you can imagine was, well, kind of short and nerdy. Um, <laughs> and, um, but, but good in English. So, oh, I, I, I'm just noticing, as, as, as the gentleman in the white shirt over there moves things around, uh, if, if Google has these how to use your brain things. What, what, what's the actual title on it? How to care for your big, wonderful, high-performing brain. Yes, how to care for your big, wonderful, high-performing brain. Um, if you find one of those around campus, oh, half the people have them. I realize you all want to go work for Google, but an entertaining act might be to see how many of uh, the little factoids and stuff you think are directly contradicted or directly contradict the contents of this course. Um, there are a variety of, of, of oddities on, on that. that uh, um, but it's, it's not bad, and, and you should send your resume to Google and become rich and famous, um, uh, rather than just being a nerdy high school freshman. Um, who was good in English? So I was in, in, in sophomore honors English. Great. In sophomore honors English was... Um, at least through the fog of memory, a, uh, a very beautiful, very brilliant uh, cheerleader um, <laughs> and uh, uh, woman person. Um, and if we return to the psychopathology of, of uh, theory of love, um, I, 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 I was pretty infatuated with her. Um, the question is, the pick A or B question is, um, A, I, uh, you know, let her know that, 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 that this infatuation was sort of sitting next to her in class whenever possible. Um, and, uh, and, and we, uh, uh, you know, had a perfectly nice high school relationship, or B, she managed to graduate from high school com presumably completely unaware uh, that, um, uh, that I had been deeply infatuated with her. Uh, how many people vote for A? Uh, how many people vote for B? Uh, so why isn't John Kerry voting? You would think of all people he ought to be voting, wouldn't you? <laughs> He does have excellent hair. Um, 
All right, all right. So, uh, look, John, stop grinning at me. We can't all marry billionaires. Um, in any case. <laughs> All right, so the intuition, the intuition of the vast, cruel bulk of you is correct. Um, I, 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 I suspect in her life I kept sort of turning up like a bad penny. Um, I was continuously around, um, but, but uh, there was no relationship there. Why not? What was my problem? We won't ask for vast details. Yeah, all right, we'll ask for some details here. <laughs> Uh, fear, yeah, fear works, um, but it, it didn't bother, we, in the last example we had Romeo there, and, you know, he was presumably scared out of his little wits more or less, yeah? That, yeah, that, that sounds good. So, there's, there's, so, so but, but, uh, no, okay, I, I th- self-confidence. Yeah, I, I think I won't pursue this further because I may learn way more than I want to know about exactly why um, I should have been fearful, low self-confidence, and, and, and otherwise. Um, but the fact, the fact is I, 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 I didn't... Uh, um, I, I didn't do nothing. Um, and the, the other fact that occurs to me is that it would be entirely possible by this point that, that her son or daughter could be a student here. Um, yeah, there's a, I heard a good deep intake of breath there. There's a scary thought. Um, but, um, all right. So, the, 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 the intuition is clear. Um, now, suppose, let's flip the example around. And, and uh, ask, uh, suppose that uh, the, 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 this, uh, you know, gorgeous and brilliant um, uh, high school sophomore was um, uh, attracted to some nerdy little uh, high school freshman or something like that. Um, would she uh, do anything about that one way or the other? Uh, let, let's do the A or B vote here. How, how, how many? How many vote that um, uh, that the that, that, that she would say? Uh, you know, uh, 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 say, let's go out together, and that you know his you know hair would curl or something. Um, <laughs> the uh, how many vote? Yes, she would do that. How many vote? No. Okay, well, a little, little more divided. There's more chance that maybe she would say something, but the majority goes with the no or the, I'm not voting on this. I just, I voted once today already. <laughs> maybe I voted twice. But anyway, um, wh- wh- why, why, the why is good, would be okay, but what, what, why not? What, what's, what's wrong here that, uh, um, economics? Oh, I could. I should have. No, I, 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 either we're sitting here reading the handout, or, or he's on to. So, where, where's economics, man? Yeah. Uh, no. Uh, what, what, what? Her, uh, her kind of value to other people would go down if she went out with them. Oh, <laughs> we don't have to make this quite so specific, do we? <laughs> So I, sh- I should add that, um, I mean, this would be, of course, deeply pathetic if, if, if since high school I had been a, 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 a broken and pathetic um, you know, person who'd never formed a meaningful relationship with another person and I was still waiting for her. Um, but when I did finally get engaged to somebody, my, my dear sister's first reaction was sort of like that, which was, how did you ever get somebody so attractive to go with you? <laughs> And my mother's, my mother's first reaction, we were going to be engaged for two years um, because, my, 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 I, it, it, because we'd been reading up on the early, this was you know, a long time ago before evolutionary psych was big, but we were ahead of the curve and we knew that, that she had to be a couple of years younger than me because she needed to be evolutionarily fit. Um, anyway, she was two years younger than me. I was already up here in grad school. She was still at Princeton as an undergrad, so we would get married two years later when she graduated. Um, my mother's first declaration on this subject was that if anything happened to the relationship in the intervening two years, she was keeping um, Julie, my, my wife, and getting rid of me. So, <laughs> the, uh, so you may be on to something there. Um, yes? Uh, in high school, women generally didn't 
Okay, so there, there's a poss- I could have flipped this around and, and, and changed the genders here, but there's a, there's a possibility of a sort of a social norm that w- the women don't ask men. Um, but I, I, I'm, uh, I will assert that uh, there would have been a certain amount of discomfort if it had been uh, gorgeous, brilliant male cheerleader um, and, and uh, hey, don't knock it, my sister-in-law married one of those. Um, at the University of Michigan, you know, the gorgeous male cheerleaders are, are, are right there. Um, but anyway, um, the, uh, I don't know how, is the MIT male cheerleading squad a big thing? No, okay. Uh, anyway, the, um, I, I think that you, there would be a certain ambivalence about this relationship, even if, even if we switched the, the genders on it. Any, any other... Uh, any other comments on this? Well, let me assert that, 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 that this... Whoops, let me assert that... I want to look at my notes. Um, that this sort of relationship feels uncomfortable um, because we have a, a, a very deeply seated desire for relationships to be reciprocal. Um, and it's not just that. So, so one might exp- uh, account for... My failure, if you want to account for my failure to ask this, 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 this young woman out in sort of economic terms, you could imagine that what I did was I sort of looked in my romance wallet and I said, I don't have enough to afford this relationship. Not in strictly economic terms, but I don't have enough uh, status for this. I'm a freshman. She's a sophomore. Made a big difference at that point, right? You know, she's this. I'm this. She's this. I'm this. You know, this isn't going to work. Um, but it also doesn't work like this. Um, if you've got, if you've got too much in the bank, in a sense, there's a a, a, a discomfort that has to do with unbalanced. Um, unbalanced relationships and there seems to be a very deeply seated notion that relationships need to be appropriately reciprocal. Now this isn't just about romance. Um, If I open the door for you, you say thank you. Now that's a very simple sort of thing but it, 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 it suggests that you feel a need to reciprocate for whatever um for whatever act um, might come your way. Um, if I ask somebody out to dinner, uh, in, in, in the subculture with, with, in which I live, the reflexive response is, if I invite somebody over to my house for dinner, their reflexive response is to say, what can I bring? Not because they have some notion that you know, uh, the, the larder is bare at home and if they don't bring something, there's no dinner, right? But th- there's a notion that needs to be reciprocal. Uh, quite typically, my response would be, oh, you don't need to, be, to bring anything. And quite typically, nevertheless, whoever's coming over would bring something anyway, right? Th- th- this. Now, you get into interesting problems. The, 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 the exact nature of what is and is not uh, appro- reciprocally appropriate um, seems to have st- a strong cultural overlay. I, this was brought home to me um, by, by a tale my parents told me, which was uh, a few years ago, new neighbors moved in. And so my parents, being nice people, brought them over as sort of a welcome to the neighborhood gift. I don't know what it was, but they brought over a little gift. That's nice, but the people who moved in were Japanese. The Japanese cultural expectation was, if you get a gift, you have to give a gift. So they gave my parents a gift, like the next day. But the expectation, my parents' expectation wasn't that they'd get a gift. So if they got a gift, there's now a reciprocal demand here. (laughs) So they gave the neighbors another gift. And to, at least to, by, by the time you get my mother's rendition of this, it sounded like the end of this was sort of medieval warfare with siege, you know, sh- lobbing gifts over the fence. <laughs> Stop it already! Um, but the, all of these examples point out that there's a deep-seated notion that relationships, we don't like one-sided relationships. We like relationships that... Um, 
that are reciprocal in, in some fashion. And the reciprocation needs to match the original act. If I invite you to dinner and you throw yourself on your face and swear eternal fealty to me, you know, that's reciprocal, but that's odd, right? That, that, that's out of proportion and, and wouldn't be right. The effort to make this, these sort of intuitions into something more than intuition, into a systematic theory, one of the efforts is known as social exchange theory. Um, it is an effort to talk about relationships, social relationships, in terms that borrow from common sense economic terms. Um, where the goal is, one of the goals is to maximize your profits. There are... Um, Benefits, there's, in, uh, there's the income side, there's the cost side, and your profits are going to be something like the subtraction of the costs from um, the benefits. Now, um, costs and benefits in social exchange are not going to be in strictly monetary terms by any stretch of the imagination. Benefits in social exchange can be tangible, like dinner. They can be intangible, like, uh, you know, a compliment of some variety. Oh, that's a lovely yellow t-shirt with some cool description on it, right? I've just, I've just, you know, added to the plus side of his ledger. Of course, I've also added to the minus side because I've directed attention to him and now he's embarrassed. You know, everybody's looking at, no, you know, it's good. I'm not getting anything back. No reciprocation here at all. (laughs) The, uh, I just got something back. A little sort of, well, anyway, um, the, uh, uh, and, and they can be internal. The, the, the benefits could be internal, like a feeling of self-worth, um, you know, so some, some boost in morale, something like that. All of these would sort of be things on the plus side and quite different than, than just straight economic transaction. And the same on the, on the minus side. Um, you could have a physical minus if you know, somebody smacks you or something like that. Um, a... Uh, a, 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 a a intangible minus, uh, you know, if I, I won't pick somebody out because that would be rude, but you know, you know oh, you, did you get enough sleep last night or something like that? You know, it sort of suggests that you kind of don't look so good and you think, I did get a lot of sleep last night, maybe I just don't look so good. You know, that, and then and it could be internal, um, uh, you know, a feeling of diminished self-worth or something like that, and then you've got your profits to... to that are, are the difference between those. Um, there is a necessary, at least at this stage of any sort of model development, there is a necessary imprecision here. Um, dinner minus two insults equals what? No, no, no. It's clear that you know, dinner, at least a decent dinner, is on the plus side. The insults are on the minus side. But you can't do the calculation the way you would do a profit-loss statement in in economics, so it is suffice it to say that in its present state, the model is qualitative more than, than quantitative, but rather like evolutionary psych, the promise is, or the hope would be, that you could move in a more quantitative, um, quantitative direction. Do people actually do any sort of math of this sort? Well, you can get some intuition about that, perhaps, by asking yourself about some sort of a scenario Um, like you go to the polls today, you're in line and you see this guy who you think you saw voting earlier in the day when you voted the first time. Um, (laughs) You think you... So what what do you do? Now... You could challenge him or not challenge him or something like that and, and ask yourself what would determine that decision. You'd sort of run down a mental checklist. If, if I challenge him, I might uh, get a, a, a sort of a tangible benefit of, of preserving the democratic process in some fashion. I get an intangible set of compliments from people all around me about my, my bold stand for, for ballot integrity and, and, and I'd get this great feeling of self-worth. On the other hand, um, I might be wrong. He might punch me. Um, and my neighbors in line might simply deride me for being a stupid busybody and getting in the way of... of and, and, and it doesn't really matter what your answer is. The, 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 the point is that 
this sort of cost-benefit analysis has the feeling of the sort of thing that we do, um, not explicitly, not on a piece of paper with a checklist, but the sort of thing that we do um, quite automatically. Um, The notion that you want to maximize your profits is only one of the core tenets of... um, Uh, of social exchange theory. You know that because the handout, I think, lists three of them. Um, One of them is to maximize your profits. Oh, there it is. It says three tenets of social exchange theory. Maximize your profits. The second one is the notion that the profits for both sides in an exchange should be roughly equal. That's the embodiment of this notion of reciprocity. That we don't like relationships where you maximize your your, 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 your profits by exploiting the other part of the, uh, the the other party to the relationship, and the third one that we haven't talked about yet um, is that a uh, for a relationship to last, it's got to be better than the perceived alternatives. So it's not enough merely for it, it, the, the the plus or minus of that checklist is not itself adequate. You need to know. Well, I mean, you can think about this in in, in boring. Uh, economic terms. You got a pile of money in in uh, in in this account. It's making one percent, so you're making money, right? But you see that there's this other opportunity over here to make five percent. Well, what are you going to do with your money? Whoosh, whoosh. You're going to move it over. Ooh, look at that! Not only did I get a sweatshirt out of the deal, I got a nickel and a cute little pink thing. He left the coin. He flipped. This is a great day. The, uh, anyway, um, so the same logic applies in social exchange theory to, um, to, to, to relationships. So you're in a, a relationship um, that, 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 that's getting you a net profit, right? In, 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 in this sort of checks and balances. You're yeah, with a perfectly nice person. You see this other person and you say... I could get 5% on my relationship over here. What do you do? Now, we'll come back later in the lecture to the, to the possible problematical nature of that tenet of social exchange theory. But the important point for now is it's not just that you want to be running positive, not negative. You want to be running as positively as possible. And you're looking at your alternatives to see how you can do that. Now, this sounds, particularly by the time we start talking about, you know, moving your investment from one person to the next person, terribly crass. Is there any evidence that people use this sort of quasi-economic um, uh, calculation in, uh, in romance, in making romantic attachments um, with, uh, with other people. There have been a number of experiments that have endeavored to look for evidence for social exchange theory principles um, in the settings of, of uh, romantic type relationships. And I want to tell you about a few of them. Um, that's, that's why you've got, um, and I, I've got all these cute little boxes on the handout that allow you to plot out the results and the, pre- the predictions and the results of it. So let me tell you about one of the uh, earlier great efforts. That's uh, down on the handout is the great computer match dance. Here's, uh, here's the way it works. Back in the 60s, In the early days of computers, um, the signs go up on campus for uh, a a big dance, um, but the thing is you're not supposed to invite anybody, you know, you're not supposed to take your date to this dance. What you're going to do is you're going to come fill out this big form collecting buckets of information on you. Your, 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 like your GPA, your, your height, your weight, um, family income, all sorts of stuff. And the people on the other side of the table when you're doing this are looking at you and rating your, um, uh, your attractiveness on a scale from like 1 to 10 or something like that. And then all this goes into a good 1960s style computer. So it's a big computer with lots of lights that flash on it. And out the other end is going to come out the person you are matched with to go to the dance. Right? Okay, you got the basic setup here. So we've got, we've got the male. He can be rated on some scale. 
you've got the, whoops, you've got the female, she can be rated on a similar scale. And, um, and the, the, the story here is that we've matched you up with the perfect person for you um, in, in, in some fashion or other. Actually, I don't think they told you that this was the way it was going to be done. It is some complicated algorithm. The fact is, the complicated al- algorithm was to flip coins. Um, before, the, 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 the pairings were completely random. So the data on any dimension that you looked for were designed that um, male and female um, ratings would be uncorrelated. Okay, now you have the dance. And the question is, this being the 60s, the issue of males asking females rather than the other way around is a much more straightforward societal norm. The question that they asked was, which males asked which females out again? For, a, a, uh, for another date. What's the social exchange prediction here? The social, is that, that's a hand? The people in the middle would ask each other again? On the diagonal. Yeah, on, on, on the, yes. So in the middle, in this sense, on, on, the, uh, on, on the diagonal of, of sort of unit slope, that people should sort themselves in... Um, uh, in, in some fashion to produce essentially reciprocal, balanced relationships. So um, this situation, you know, this quadrant is uh, the me not asking her out in high school uh, neighborhood, and this is the um, uh, you know reverse her not asking me out hypothetical relationship. Um, but these are the matched relationships that ought to work. Um, in fact, this experiment is a bomb. It doesn't work out the way social exchange theory predicted. Turns out, so that you, you look at the correlational data for all sorts of variables, and it turns out that the only variable that makes any difference is ratings of female attractiveness. And the data look like this. Basically, females who were rated as, uh, as more attractive got asked out. What's going on here? So the, the answer is the experiment was a methodological, there's a, there's, a, there's a fatal methodological flaw here. There are two possibilities. One is that social exchange theory is, is wrong. Um, but that would be, if, if, if I thought that were the case, then why would I bother to lecture about it, um, at least in this sort of detail? The other possibility is the experiment um, had a methodological flaw. So, what's the problem? Why didn't, why, didn't this, uh, why didn't this work out? Oh, out in the cheap seats, next to John Kerry there. People thought that they were well-matched, but that didn't end up being an issue. This is the, that's good. Usually I get half a dozen bizarro ideas before somebody hits on the right idea, but good for you, you got the right idea first. Um, the problem is with the cover story. It's not people specifically who are the problem, it's guys. Um, the guys thought... So, so you got to imagine a, a, a guy here, right? So uh, if, 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 this, if this is... Uh, if this is the scale from uh, of, of, of attractiveness. So you know, here's ugly guy. Um, ugly, ugly guy has thought all along that he was, you know, oh, you know, I've got, I've got a, a warm heart, but you know, I'm, I'm ugly. Um, <laughs> and then, you know, the, the, this this high tech computer spits out your perfect match, and she's gorgeous. It's it's the it's the uh, um, economics of romance equivalent to. You know, looking in the wallet and discovering you got a whole bunch of 20s you didn't know were there. You're just... And, and so the, everybody decided they were um, well-matched and, and this had its biggest effect on, uh, the, you know, uh, on, on the guys who had previously um, you know, thought that they didn't have that much in the bank and they well, I guess I can afford this. And, and so they all asked out 
the what we don't know by the way is um, which of these relationships and which of these phone calls actually ended up in a date and or relationship the the, the um, uh, social exchange prediction again would have to be that only these would have survived um, but we'll, we'll, we, we can come back to that in a minute anyway the experiments are bust because the um, uh, the, the cover story gives people the wrong idea. This makes an interesting point about the, um, these valuations. They're based on uh, your perception of the, in, in relationship space, they're based on your perception of the other and your perception of yourself. So if you are, um, you know, it, it, well, it, 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 we, have, we have met Males, for instance, who consider themselves to be God's gift to women, um, against the evidence. Um, you know, they're people who are going, if, if you have a systematic misperception of your own value, you're going to end up uh, in, in, the raw, in, in, in the non-social exchange part of this space. Um, and then the question becomes whether or not that relationship, whether or not it's a self-correcting system. If you think that you are, um, you know, a 10 on every scale and you keep asking people who are, uh, by your assessment, also 10s on every scale and they keep saying no to you, does that eventually cause you to come up with a more realistic assessment of, um, of who you might actually be in this marketplace? Um, well... We haven't got any evidence that this works at all yet. Let's go find ourselves an experiment uh, that, that doesn't have this fatal flaw in it. That's, uh, did I give this a clever name of some sort? No, it just says, let's try again. So here's this uh, Keisler and uh, B- Barrel experiment that works as follows. Um, you go into a, um, a psych lab to do what you think is some sort of a cognitive experiment. Um, The details of the task don't matter. You're you're, you're doing this task broken into two halves. And at the end, you're a guy. Um, And and at the end of the um, first half, you're going to take a break. And you're given some feedback about how you're doing. The feedback is either of the form, wow, you did really well on that. Well, most people don't get scores that are that good. You're really good at this sort of thing. So that's a... uh, you know, good, self-esteem boosting kind of bit of feedback. Or you're given feedback of the form, did you get enough sleep last night? You know, most, most people, I think they did use the get enough sleep thing, but uh, you know, most people get a higher score. On, well, never mind. It's, it's, it's okay, let's take a break. And so, you're, so, so you've gotten the bad information. Now, needless to say, this is a setup. What information you get is uncorrelated with your score. So, you know, you may have done brilliantly, you may have done badly, you have no idea how people do on this task in, in general, and, and the experimenter has flipped a coin and arbitrarily assigned you to the high self-esteem or low self-esteem group. That's the manipulation of, of, of the male. This is the guy. Now, you go down to... Um, uh, we're going to go have a snack. You and the experimenter go off to the cafeteria to have a, uh, a, a, a snack. Um, and uh, you're going to... Uh, um, I don't know, so you, sit, you get, get some food, you sit down at the table, and a female friend of the experimenter comes and says, Hi, can I sit down with you? And the experimenter says, Hi, sure. And... Um, so, the female person comes in two flavors, um, as you might guess from this two-by-two two thing. She, there's only one female here, but the manipulation here is she's either looking good or she's looking bad. She's, yeah, she, she's I, 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 I don't think I've ever seen pictures of this, so I don't quite know what the description, you know, how they did this, but the idea is that, that, that she's... Uh, arranged herself to look attractive or, or uh, comparatively unattractive. 
Okay, same person, so you know, no, no personality variables changing and, and, and a fairly tight script. And at this point, the experimenter says, oh, blah, 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 I need to go rinse a few things out. Um, I'll be right back. You two talk. And so this woman, also an experimenter, is sitting there, and the data for this experiment are um, any indications of romantic interest on, on the part of the, um, the guy. You know, does he ask for her phone number would be a sort of a transparent kind of thing. But there's a long checklist of, of, of things that he might do or say that would indicate some sort of interest. And you're just making little check marks. So, um, presumably relatively subtly, not sitting there with a... Yeah. Can I have you? <laughs> All right. So the, uh, um, the, the 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 trivial social exchange prediction is he's looking good. Sorry, he's feeling good. She's looking good. It must be love, kind of thing. And this is where most of yeah, this, this is the cell that gets the highest number of indications of interest. The question is, where's the second highest set of, of uh, uh, the marks in this experiment? And the answer is down here. She's looking bad. He's feeling bad. It must be a match. Um, <laughs> And these two, and these two lag behind. I don't, I don't know if, if which which one is three and which one is four, um, actually. But 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 the important point is that um, there are more indications of interest here, as would be predicted by a um, social exchange theory that's looking for matching, um, and and. Uh, uh, you know, you, 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 this, this is the case where you looked in your wallet and you discovered um, that you actually had a couple less 20s than you thought, but you still want to buy something. And, well, I guess. Doesn't this sound terrible? <laughs> the, um, well, all right, it not only sounds terrible, it sounds a little on the artificial side. Um, is there any evidence that this happens in um, a more realistic setting? And um, the, the effort to figure that out is, is, was done uh, with, with the realistic setting of large introductory psychology classes. Um, so I, I, large intro psych class, I think, maybe Minnesota or Ohio State, some place where they had a huge intro class. Um, and what they did was they... Uh, uh, largely freshman class, they looked for who formed relationships. So let's go, and it's just like the computer match dance thing, but we'll take the relationships first and work backwards from that. So they got like 213, I think, couples out of these, out of, out of intro psych. Um, and um, they did the same business. Rated them on attractiveness, rated them on... Um, uh, on, on, on everything under the sun, SAT scores, uh, that, uh, religion, all sorts of stuff, um, and, and scatter plot the data. What you find is that uh, the, these freshman uh, uh, pairings were not highly correlated. They weren't random like if you randomized uh, in, in the computer match thing. There, there, are, um, there are factors that were... Um, that, that, that did correlate. Um, but they weren't particularly striking. But now, let's ask... So we, we've got some cloud of data points again with perhaps some positive correlation to it. Let's come back two years later um, and ask who's still together. And what you find two years later... I don't remember how many were still together, but of the ones who were still together, now... Essentially, all of the variables correlated. So, you could pick anything you liked. SAT scores, uh, religion, uh, looks, socioeconomic status. And now, it's not that it all lay on the line of unit slope. 
It's not that somehow, you know, you went to State University of Minnesota or something like that and you found the one person who had um, exactly the same SAT scores as you. Um, and, 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 and their parents made exactly the same amount of money and, and, and you were exactly the same height and, 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 and all the, uh, it's amazing. No, no, you know, it, it, what, what you've got is, it, it's still a big cloud of data points, but now all the variables are positively correlated. That the, um, well, what's the cliche here? That we're, I'll give you a hint. Thank you. Birds of a feather flock together would be the sort of punchline of this experiment. That after, there may have been a degree of of noise in the initial assortment, but the relationships that lasted were the relationships where, um, uh, uh, where the birds of a feather were flocking together. And that hand is going to say, but... Thank you. Next thing on the uh, handout says, the other cliche is um, opposites attract. Now the thing about cliches is that cliches don't get to be cliches unless there is an element of truth in there somewhere. The element of social exchange theory truth in opposites attract is that opposites attract when they increase each other's profits. So the sense in which opposites attract is she talks, he listens. From the outside, it may look like, my goodness, he talks all the time or she talks all the time. Um, you know, and, and, and she never says a word. How can, they, how can they live together? Well, the answer is it's a great deal easier probably to live together that way than if they both talk all the time. <laughs> You know, those two birds of a feather are, are going to you know, drive each other sort of nuts. Um, and, you know, uh, he's a great cook, she's a great eater. Um, or, 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 you know, at least a, 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 an appreciative audience or something like that. That is the sense in which opposites attract. There's no particular evidence that opposites attract in... The uh, well, I mean, you can ask yourself about uh, a, a sort of roommate issues, um, where there's a certain amount of random assortment of, of of people, or at least I gather here you, you sort of pick your roommate on the basis of, of sketchy information when you arrive. Is that that the current scheme? Yeah, so it's, 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 a, it's a sort of a courtship on the basis of, of limited information. Anyway, when you discover that even though you were correlated on a bunch of variables, it turns out that there are a few variables that really matter, like um, person A is a slob, person B is a neatness freak. That ain't an opposites attract kind of situation. In, there's a couple of heads shaking around here saying, yeah, I know that. Um, or, 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 it, or in our lab, she wants it to be 80 degrees, I want it to be about 50 degrees. That ain't opposites attract. But there we have it. This is also a not reciprocal, um, asymmetrical relationship where I'm the boss, so I get to play with the thermostat first. (laughs) Unless Kristen gets in first, in which case it's tropical season in the lab. (laughs) It's, uh, we tough it out. Anyway, the problem is she's got numbers on her side. The other people in the lab seem to like it hot. I don't understand them. Um, Anyway, their opposites attract... In, in, uh, in these sort of romantic relationships um, when they increase each other's um, uh, profits. That's a useful, um, I don't know, complication to keep in mind. It's not just a matter of, you know, we all rate each other on all these scales and then pick the closest thing to exactly us. That's not what's going on. What you're doing, that, that's going to end up being um, one factor, but there's also there's this more general factor of what you're looking for are um, relationships that are profitable and roughly equally profitable for both sides in the um, uh, in in the relationship. The um, well, okay, so let's. Uh, I I I, th- I think I couched the next. Well, actually, here, let's see. I think I couched the next bits as. Um, the problem set, the, yeah, the social exchange 
problem set. Let, let's turn to that after taking a, uh, a brief break here. The... Uh, So we're not really on the syllabus anymore. What chapter are we in right now? It says I, I think it's a, does it say 10 or 11? It's, it's, it's a social psych. Well, this, like, this is the syllabus. This is the syllabus. Gender stuff in there. Um, well, they, 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 this is the case where, where out of the very large set of things in social psychology, I've ended up selecting um, a, pa- a sort of a, a love and romance path through these topics. You will, for instance, I think, find social exchange theory in there. Uh, you will find uh, yeah, the, 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 the topics are there. I'm just using. Is this, is this in the book? I don't think so. Maybe it's. it's I, I can't remember. You know, it, it, it's. The problem is every time I find something cool, then the, 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 the you know Gleitman or now Riesberg finds something cool, and you know what you're gonna do. Um, I have another question about the paper. Yeah. Okay. So on your note, uh, like on today's notes, you said that. Sure, 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 sure. Absolutely, yes. I, they, they, they're, just, they're not a nice systematic set. Okay. The, the problem is that originally my scheme was that you could use, you, you, you could write these three different types of papers crossed with these three different chapter ranges. And so the original notion was you could do one of these things where you're going to read one of the papers in the uh, in the folders. You could do that for the the, the, uh, the sort of science writing cha- paper, and you could do that either for paper one, two, or three, and my, my TAs said, that's wacko. We'll never figure out how to grade these things. So we ended up constraining it. And so then I stopped doing the... the, the but I thought, well, I'm not going to just throw out the cool stuff I... Cl-. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. Don't worry about it. If you like something on the website, use it. Okay, good. You don't have to find something um, on the website. I have another question. It's a little confusing, but you know that you said that Sleep and Dreams is chapter 16, but um, it seems that chapter 16 is more about, like... Uh, it, it, Freud. It's just a, I think oh, it's, yeah, it's what. That, no, I, I, I better say a word about the, the, the syllabus and the and the. Uh, and, and the uh, I'll, I'll say that in one okay, second good. here. And the last. Um, oh. Yeah, yeah, no, no, we're, we're gonna we're gonna c- come back at three thirty if you want okay, to sure. talk about more things. All right. You want to know the an- you want to know that answer for your recitation, not across recitations. Oh. What, what's your score? I went to 170, 170. So that's high 80s, high 80 percent. You're fine. You're, you're, uh, again, it depends on your recitation, but you're um, at or above average in, in in any of the recitations, I think. So. But, it's recitation specific um, you, you know th- th- that sounds to me like you know if all of your other scores are like that you'll be on the AB border somewhere um, let me say a quick word I got a couple of questions about the syllabus let me say a quick word about this um, the, the chapters the chapters that are assigned at the moment for instance are the chapters on social psychology uh, like any topic here huge area I'm taking a sort of a love and romance cut through it so I think for instance you'll find stuff about um, social exchange theory in the book but not particularly in this uh, heavily romantic not, not necessarily in this sort of straight you know love and romance uh, track I'm assigning chapters that are um, the, it, it'll it'll be less obvious that the book and I are are marching in lockstep than it might have been say for the memory chapter or something. Uh, so for I'll, I, I, somebody pointed out that the sleep and dreams lecture has associated with it a chapter that's uh, that seems to be like about mental illness. Well, that's because sleep and dreams is going to be connected with Freudian interpretation of dreams. It's all part of talking about um, uh, Freud and psychoanalysis. So that's the, that, that's the most relevant chapter at the moment. But you shouldn't think it'll be less true for this half of the course than for the first half of the course that there's a, an absolute clear match between the set of topics in lecture one day and the set of topics in, in the accompanying chapter. They will talk to each other, but they will not match up quite as, as, uh, as, as tightly as they might have earlier in the course. Um, 
All right, so let me, let, let, let's do a few social exchange sort of problems. Um, one of these is the problem of bad relationships. One of the mysteries on the face of it is why would somebody stay in a relationship that's, um, that's running a deficit? Uh, perhaps the clearest example of this is why would a woman stay in an abusive relationship? I pick a woman because while there are males who are abused in, in, uh, in heterosexual relations and other males who are abused in homosexual relations, the bulk of abused uh, partners in relationships are women. Um, but so... Why would anybody stay in an abusive relationship? Why would a woman stay in an abusive relationship? That's where this third tenet of social exchange theory comes in. The social exchange answer to the question is, you would stay in a bad relationship if you couldn't see a better alternative. Um, and so, you know, if you imagine a hypothetical situation of somebody in an abusive relationship, um, maybe she's got a couple of kids and... and um, while she was raising these kids, she's not working. So what's she going to do? You know, if she leaves, what, what's she going to do with the kids? Where she go? How's she going to feed herself, etc.? Um, part of the logic of things like uh, shelters for abused women is a logic of giving an alternative that looks better than the state you're in now. There's nobody saying that uh, you know, living in a, in a, a shelter for, uh, for abused women is, is a relationship that's running a great big positive score. But if it's running less of a negative than the, the relationship that you're in, you might get out of the, um, the, abusive, um, the abusive relationship. So that's, that's part of what drives this notion that it's important not just what the sign of your profit loss statement is, but um, what the alternatives that you perceive are. Now, and, and, the, and the you perceive part is important here too, because um, we all know people who are in relationships where you, from the outside, look at this relationship and you think, you yeah, know, that's not a good relationship. What, 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 why is he in that? Why is she in that? Um, but if they see it as the best current possibility, that relationship in social exchange theory will be, uh, will be relatively stable. Um, now, these next two are sort of related to each other. Who has power in a relationship and, and, and uh, who works harder in a relationship. In, in a sense, they're sort of the reciprocals of each other. Who works harder is the person with less power. Um, let, let, let's, let's do this through a, a, a sort of a cartoon, uh, uh, sit, uh, sort of, and another sort of cliche uh, relationship out there. Um, young, beautiful woman um, and old, less than beautiful guy. Um, what's the other part of the description of the guy? Rich. Why? We need a hand here. What? Well, 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 nobody's got a clue. Yeah, yeah, he's all here. Yeah, all right, all right. Um, that, that gives him a way in which he doesn't have to work all the time. That's... Well, he's, there's this perception that she's got more... She, she's bringing more to the relationship than he is, right? So she, in a sense, has power. If she looks around and looks, what are my alternatives? You know, here I am, uh, in a beautiful, all right, so I'm hanging out here. Gee, I ought to be able, if I look at my alternatives, to move here, so I have a certain power to uh, to, to move if I if I'm this young beautiful female person hypothetically, and um, what he's got to do, the reason he's got to work hard is to prevent that movement. Well, how do you prevent that movement? One way to do it is to uh, increase, or, or well, actually, I suppose it's not to prevent that movement. It's to make that movement within the within the relationship that you're in now. So if um, if she's 
giving, uh, if, if, if she's a 10 and he's a 1 or a 2 or something, he's got to make himself into a 10. How does he make himself into a 10? He can't make himself young. He can't make himself beautiful. What he's got to do is, you know, in the cliche version, shower her with diamonds and, 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 and uh, furs or something like that, increasing, um, you know, the, the benefits that she's getting in this relationship so that other relationships don't look more attractive. So the basic notion is that if you're bringing less apparent stuff to the relationship, your partner is sitting there saying, I could do better, at least hypothetically, and you're sitting there saying, if I don't want him, her, to go elsewhere, I've, I've got I've to I've be more loving, or I've got to be, you know, cook better, or I've, 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 I've got to do something here, so I'm the one who's got to work hard, and, 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 uh, and, and the, the other is the one with the, um, the other is the one with the, the power there. Now, um, our romantic relationships really just this crass economic kind of thing. Sounds pretty grim. Well, there are important differences between economic exchange and social exchange. One of them we've already pointed to, which is the fact that the economic costs and benefits are typically much more calculable than the, um, the social ones. That's the dinner minus two insults problem. Um, the other one that I point out here is that the rules of negotiation, what's permissible as negotiation in economic exchange, um, is considered desperately gauche, you know, not done in social relations. Right? So look, you know, you just wouldn't have a conversation that says, you know, you can come up to my room later if you take me to dinner. Okay, what kind of dinner do you want? Well, you got to take me to a four-star restaurant. No way we'll go to Burger King. You know, uh, no, uh, 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 no, no, uh, how, how about uh, three stars, three stars, go for three stars. All right, how about, how about the two-star Thai place down the street? Um, okay, it's a deal, but you can only come up for 20 minutes. You know. Uh, I don't, it doesn't, doesn't sound like that sort of haggling in strictly economic terms is not uh, is, is not co- sort of considered mainstream romance mostly um, it's also not really mainstream uh, uh, US economic um, haggling these days either you, you, you don't you know, if you go to Target and want to argue about the, 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 the price of a toaster oven or something they're not actually going to be that interested um, but in those places in, in the economic sphere where haggling is still permissible a talented um, a, a, a talented haggler a talented negotiator will work hard to be your friend. Why? Because the, 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 the clearest example that I know of in American economic life is car dealerships. Go to a car dealership. You will do this one of these days. Go to a car dealership. The guy who comes out, typically a guy, who comes out to sell you a car is going to be your best buddy almost, interest, almost instantaneously. Very nice, friendly guy. Why? Well, maybe he's a very nice, friendly guy. We shouldn't disparage that possibility. But the other reason is that if you you behave to him as though you are in a social exchange while he knows perfectly well that what you are doing is an economic exchange he's going to make money because you are disabled you cannot argue with your friend about money in the way you can argue with somebody in a strictly economic um, in a strictly economic marketplace so he's going to be your friend you're going to come to a nice friendly agreement and then it turns out that after you have made this deal that's not enough. You shake hands on that. That's not quite enough because then he's got to go talk to his manager about it. He's such a good friend of yours that he may have gone a little too far, he worries. So he's got to go talk to the manager and the manager is not your friend. 
So he's got to go and talk to the... But, but he's your friend, so he'll go and fight it out with the manager. He goes... You're never invited to this discussion, by the way. He goes back to talk to um, the bad manager. And I think what they actually do is they chortle a little bit about uh, you know, their kids and, 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 and the Red Sox and stuff like that. And then your friend comes back with a sad face and says, my mean, nasty, evil manager, not in quite those terms won't go for it. We can't, we can't, we just can't do this. You know, you, you, we, we, you and I, we could do this with just an extra, say, 500 bucks of your money. Um, and because we're friends, you put up the 500 bucks. And this, uh, I, I, I think, uh, the, I, I don't know this, but I think that car dealers are explicitly, in, they, they, they know about social psychology, they're explicitly instructed that this is a useful way to, to negotiate. Um, that by being your friend, by moving the discussion from an economic exchange to a social exchange, because of the differences in those sorts of interactions, that can be exploited in a way that... Um, that makes you money. Uh, makes money for the for the, the car dealer. Uh, the the the, uh, the most uh, beautiful example of this in my own personal experience was not at a car dealership, but was in uh, the, the the city of Marrakesh in Morocco, um, where uh, you know everything is negotiable. You know. The, 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 cup of water is the, the price is negotiable but anyway a lot of haggling there and um, so I was there for a conference and, 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 and we get to, to, we were taken off as a group for a tour of the uh, the old market which is great you should all go there sometime we went to the to, the, to a rug merchant um, this was early in my career I didn't have no money um, so I'm not buying any rugs because to buy rugs it's good to have money um, so I'm sitting there drinking Buckets of, of mint tea, which is what you get in Morocco, um, while other people are negotiating for rugs. It's kind of fun to watch. But at some point, some guy decides that he's going to sell me a rug. And he ta- he's going to show me the special rugs out back. Okay. So we're going out back. We're up the back stairs. And he asks me, are you Jewish? Yeah, well, you know. My mother brought me up to be honest. Yes, I'm Jewish. The next thing you know, we're hugging and kissing. Because he's Jewish too. Last week, I think he was a Methodist. But <laughs> in any case, so, he, by, but, so not now, now we're friends, of course. Not friends. I mean, we're practically blood relations. He shows me only rugs we, uh, woven I, 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 by Jewish virgins. The, uh, how, how do you know this is the case? Well, they've got this six-pointed star on them, as he points out. Well, it turns out that every rug in Morocco seems to have six-pointed stars on it, but never mind. Plus, the guy has also taken his intro psych class, and he knows about forced choice psychophysics. Rather than saying, do you like this rug? What he's doing is holding up two rugs and saying, which one do you like better? <laughs> so you've got to give an answer, right? I like that one better. Okay, it goes in the stack. By the time we're playing this game a little while, we not only does he have the theory that I'm buying a rug, I'm buying a stack of rugs. <laughs> well, I still don't have any money. The, uh, and, and, and so I remember what it said in the guidebook. In the guidebook, it said that if you're at the state store, if you're, you, know, you can go to the state store because at the state store, they only mark up by 50%. And so you should negotiate, you know, you do the price you're looking for is to negotiate down by about 50%, and, and then everybody will be happy. So I remember this, and we're in the state rug store. I know what I'm going to do. I'll offer this guy 10% of his asking price. He'll be so offended that he throws me out. All right? So I offer him 10%, and he accepts. <laughs> Now, you want to re- violate both the borders of social and economic exchange. Backing off your own offer is really, really rude. And at that point, he threw me out, um, which is too bad. I probably should have just maxed out the credit card because I think I probably had a pretty good deal at that point. But in any case, it was another beautiful example of trying to use the rules of social exchange um, not, a, not to mention a half a dozen other bits of applied psychology to make, uh, to, to close an economic deal. Um, and I think all my friends who came back saying, I got him down to only 50% of the price probably made a bunch of people really, really happy. Um, 
So, the, um, the last thing I want to mention here is, uh, is one last problem in social exchange. That's the problem of vastly unequal and, and, and inevitably unequal relationships. There are relationships out there that are simply not going to be reciprocal. Um, one of the clear examples um, are parent-child relationships. Right? Even if you think in strict economic terms, how much money have your parents put into you? How much money have you put into your parents? I mean, and it doesn't get any better by the time you're my age, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's an inevitably, uh, it's inevitably a relationship that is, is going to be unequal. And that produces, as you may have noticed at various stages in your life, a sense of discomfort about that inequality. How do you deal with it? There are lots of ways to deal with it, and, and social exchange theory is not capable of predicting which, you know, which one to choose at this point. But, you know, for example, a, a, a very typical early adolescent one is the assertion to one's parents, you never did nothing for me. Right? No rational, uh, you know, 13-year-old really, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you ask, you know, uh, you really, you know, yeah, in the midst of some fight, you never did nothing for me. Okay, where did the food come from? Well, yeah, you did that, but it's, it's, not a, it's not a logical statement, but it's a statement that attempts to balance the accounts in some fashion. It's a way of dealing with this feeling that the relationship is, is, uh, is unequal. Um, there are the, 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 the parental... How many, how many of you have heard at some point the line from your, your, your parents, one day you should have a child like you? Or words to that effect? Uh, well, that, that, that's, that's, that's another sense in which this can be balanced. The, 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 the parental notion that um, the accounts will be balanced when your children do unto you as you have done to, uh, to your parents. And guess what? Your parents are right. Um, and, 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 oh, how many, can, can, can you remember thinking at some point that um, you're never, should you ever have children, you're never going to say anything as stupid to your own children. As, oh, well, you know, one perfectly lovely concrete example. Why do I have to do this? The, an, the parental answer to which is, because I said so. Have you heard the little voice in your, in your head promising that you will never say anything that lame to your own kids? <laughs> Guess what? It, it's, it's very grim. Uh, it, it, you know, and, and, and you can just sit there listening to yourself as you say it. You say, oh God, I said I'd never do that. All right. But there's an, beyond that realm... What do you do about these unequal relationships? Last thought. There's an interesting thought that comes out of Roger Brown's book, uh, Social Psychology, a beautifully written uh, textbook on social psychology. Um, He talks about the central exchange in social exchange. The argument is that not all of the relationship, not, not, not all of the interactions need to be between you and another and the person with whom you are having a relationship at this particular moment. There can be a bank in there. Um, Here's the experimental evidence, last, uh, or a bit of experimental evidence, last little two by two on there. Um, And and my my new free nickel will do just fine. Uh, It's it's becoming a slightly archaic example because most people don't use phone booths anymore, but you you still know what a phone booth is, right? You go into a phone booth. The first thing you do before going and and dialing the number or anything is to check what? Not if you have a quarter. Is there a quarter in the the change slot, right? Everybody goes and checks that little change slot. Oh, I've just changed her life. Check next time. Sometimes there's a quarter there. It's really good. Anyway, what these guys did... All right, we can use this two by two here. Um, what, uh, what this experiment did was to, to, to um, spike uh, phone booths. They put quarters in the phone booth. And so you go into the phone booth, and some people got a coin. And some people didn't get a coin. 
That's so. This is not a big change in your life, but it is an unreciprocated good, right? You're getting this good, but you can't say, "I got to go do something for the guy who gave me a quarter." Can't can't work. So here's what happens next: You come out of the phone booth, having made your phone call, and as you're walking out, a, a, a woman comes by and she trips, and her stuff goes all over the place. The question is, do you help her? No. Oh, 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 long way to the floor. Um, and the data are from this particular experiment. Um, so uh, it's uh, help and no help of the people who got a coin in this particular study. Fourteen helped. One didn't. Um, of the people who didn't get a coin, so this is the bulk of the population as a whole. Two people helped, and 24 didn't. I don't know why they. So now that's very interesting. That suggests that just getting that coin produced a, 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 a what, what Brown would see as a, as a reciprocal as, as, as a an effort to reciprocate to the world more generally. Now, that's a big effect. Does this mean that, um, that we could make the world a better place by mailing everybody a quarter? Doesn't sound right. Now, the experimental evidence that it's not right comes from another version of this experiment. You're at home, somebody rings the doorbell and gives you, uh, and, and says, I'm new in town, I'm setting up a new company, it's gonna, we're going to sell paper. Um, I wanted you to have this, uh, this stationery. Just, a, you know, and that's my stationery, thanks. Bye. Shortly thereafter, you get a phone call. Somebody on the phone says, eh, you know, is so-and-so there? No, you got the wrong number. Oh, no, I'm in a phone booth. I got, I, I, I don't have any more money. Could you please call Fred and tell him I'll be home late or something like that? I don't remember what the exact story is, but the, it's a request to do a favor. If you, uh, if you just got the phone call, no paper involved, only 12% of people were willing to do this favor. If you got the paper and you got a phone call five minutes later, 80% of people complied. But if you got the paper and were called 20 minutes later, it had dropped back down to 12 so it produced a little bump of good feeling. Now, does this, now, what we don't know, because you can't really do the experiment, is whether this means that the central exchange idea is trivial and is a very short-lived, teeny phenomenon, or if you live a life where much bigger good things happen to you, or for that matter, bad things, do you end up with a, an account at the central exchange? If life is good in general, do you feel a central exchange obligation to be good to others? If life is bad in general, do you feel a, a, a need to, you know, trip people and watch the folders fly.